Hello everyone! So if you can see us, uh, if you can hear us, set the thumbs up because we are going to start one of the most incredible workshops in our history, Advanced Data Modeling. That's Alex Voloshnev, Developer Advocate at Datastax, and today with me a very special guest, Mr. Artyom Chibatko. Uh, Chibatko, sorry, <laughs> I'm doing mistake here as well. Uh, yeah, um, so it looks like we are good. Hello everyone. Nice yeah. to be here. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, we are all good and sound quality should be good. I see some people from yesterday uh, meet up at uh, Polska Data Ops. Uh, hi, uh, Mr. Ribeiro. Um, great. Okay. So, 120 people overall watching us right now. And that's great. That's a uh, good time to start for us, I think. So, um, let's then proceed with the first, first things first. Uh, our uh, speakers for today, our main speaker for today is uh, Artem, uh, that's Solution Architect at Datastax, author of Data Modeling Methodology for Apache Cassandra, one of the best experts for data modeling in the world, with uh, dozens of years uh, in the database research and things, and many of the publications uh, in international venues uh, regarding all of the data things, so that's great. And I guess you know me already, I'm developer advocate at Datastax, running a lot of workshops and educational events for you. And uh, before we start, um, a little bit of housekeeping. So. Uh, what's, uh, we, as we usually do, we have courses um, on YouTube and mostly probably you are watching us live at YouTube, but if you have any problems with YouTube streaming, any delays or whatever, you may switch to Twitch. That's our plan B, so where you can get um, another stream. Important thing, we don't monitor uh, Twitch comments, so if you want to ask questions, let's proceed to the second point, questions. Easiest way to ask questions in the, is the YouTube chat, but that's not the most correct one, let's say, because as soon as uh, YouTube stream is over, chat, uh, chat is gone, and we recommend you to use Discord to ask questions. We have our own Discord server with around eight or 9,000, I believe, people there, and uh, you can ask questions and communicate with Datastax experts and also Cassandra experts all over the world. Uh, to do the homework, notice I say homework, and uh, do all the exercises on your own, we suggest to use Katakoda at katakoda.com slash datastacks. We will send a better link uh, later on. So, first thing is important to us is how Cassandra organizes data. This workshop is one of the most important workshops we are doing because you cannot be, you cannot deliver successful and efficient uh, our application working with Cassandra if your data model is wrong. Cassandra offers great features like highest possible availability, incredible performance. But if your data model is bad, it will not work. Efficiency here is the shared responsibility. You need to not only install and run Cassandra, but also design your data model. That's what this workshop is about. We will speak about how Cassandra organizes data. That matters a lot. So, first thing we start is the key space. Key space is uh, the group, for, is a grouping of tables with shared configuration settings. In this case, we create a key space called library. And then you create a key space, you must define at least one configuration property, network, uh, which is a strategy for replication. So replication is going to be network topology strategy. There are two uh, kind of strategies here. Simple strategy, which is good for your laptop and uh, it's bad for anything else. And network topology strategy, which is good for the production or staging environments. It's called a network topology strategy because it's aware of a network topology. So it understands your servers, server racks and data centers. In this case, we create a key space group for tables. 
the for data center west with replication factor 3 and data center east with replication factor 5. So, for every table, uh, for every key space, we may have multiple tables, of course, and we store data in the tables. In this case, uh, we have um, in the key space library, we have table artifacts and the news by year. So that's our key space as described above, the group for uh, tables. And here we for example, how do we create table? So create table, key space, table name, then use by year, and then the description for the table. So how it's going to be structured, how it's organized. So we are going to have year integer, name, text, country, text, homepage, text, primary key, consisting of year and name, where name is a clustering column and year is the partition key. Therefore, for our table venues by year, primary key uh, will be year name and partition key year. So we will be partitioned based on the year. That's a partition is a very important idea. Uh, partition is the base unit of access. Everything in Cassandra is organized with the partitions. And if you don't understand partitions, there is a very little chance to build an efficient data model. So we will speak a bit more about that today. Um, as for this example, we create this table, the news by year with a partition key year. Therefore, we will have as much partitions for this table, as much years, uh, distinct years, we have in this table. In this example, we are having those for year 2019 and year 2015. Therefore, we have two partitions in this example. And how those partitions are distributed? As said, we are, uh, do you remember our key space definition? DC West 3, DC East 5. We may have more data centers in these um, cluster, it doesn't matter, as they are not mentioned here, we will not have them uh, deliver it. Uh, for, uh, we will not have these key space tables in these uh, data centers, because we kind of uh, ignore them. So we will work only with those two. Then data is distributed. Uh, for the data center vest, every partition of every table in this key space will be replicated three times accordingly to the replication factor three. So we have year 2015, one, two, three, and we have year 2019, one, two, three. Uh, the same idea is for the data center east, but as it has replication factor five, we will have therefore one, two, three, four, five uh, for first partition, one, two, three, four, five for the second partition. And obviously, we will have some nodes uh, storing both of those two partitions. Uh, good. How do we operate with the data uh, using Cassandra query language, CQL? There are two main parts of that. Data definition language and data manipulation language. So what's the data definition? That's everything what we use to operate the schema, for example. So how uh, we organize the structure of our data. Here we have create key space, create table. Must be pretty obvious. Create index, create custom index. When we are you, when we are creating secondary indexes. Create materialized view when we are creating materialized views. For the data manipulation, we have uh, all the standard um, operations, what uh, you want to have with the normal data. Select, insert, update, delete. So no big surprises that still create, read, update, delete, typical for every of the databases. When we speak about uh, Cassandra query language, create table, we have to discuss following things. First, when we create table, we are obviously going to have a table name, that's pretty obvious. When we have to define columns, uh, what will fit in this table? Cassandra is not schemaless, so we need to have uh, clear de table definitions. So we have column name, column type, like uh, integer or blob or whatever you prefer in this in your situation. Then it may be static. 
uh, static uh, brings uh, a lot of questions usually it's not so widely used option it allows you to share the same value through the wall partition so you set it once you have it for the wall partition then the primary key uh, we can define first part as the partition key and second part of the clustering columns and finally we can define clustering order so you, if you i hope you remember clustering columns are um, we use clustering columns for two purposes first one is to ensure uniqueness if a uh, partition key is not enough we have to add some fields we have to add some columns to make uh, unique uh, primary keys so we will not overwrite data with our apps absurds so when uh, we use clustering columns to make to ensure what primary key is unique and second option when we need to use clustering columns if you want to establish sorting order for example when i'm doing uh, when i'm uh, managing comments uh, for the videos on youtube or let's imagine we are handling youtube we have video we have comments to this video when uh, i open a video i want to see comments well, usually I don't want to see comments, they are mostly awful, but uh, still let's imagine I do want. Then I want these comments to be sorted, most recent first. With a clustering column, I also establish not only uniqueness, but also sorting order. Row ordering within the partition. Then, as the partition key and partitions in general is the base unit of access and everything for us basically everything it's all data model is about to design good partitions let's say or maybe 80 percent of uh, this work is to design good partitions then um what's it about we can have two two kinds of a partition single row partition and multiple row partition what is a single row partition if i have as a partition key an unique uh, value which is uh, never repeats itself for example in this case i have table users with id is universally unique id have you seen those uh, strings before like very 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 long uh, strings let's call it universally unique identifiers they are very often used by cassandra and cassandra based applications when i have name text and email text with this design, create table users, ID, name, email, primary key, ID. ID will be the partition key. What does that mean? I will have as much partitions as I have uh, users. And that's perfectly fine. I don't know why many people are worrying about that, like, oh, I'm going to have so much partitions. That's bad. Uh, no, 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 that's not bad. That's okay to have a lot of uh, partitions. Don't worry. Uh, that's fine. You may have, if, even if you have billions and billions of users, you may have billions and billions of partitions. That's fine. Don't worry. Then our second option here is the multiple row partitions. Um, multiple row partitions means what I'm, uh, what some of my rows will share the partition key value. In this example, I'm creating a list of Artifacts by venue with venue text, year tag, integer, artifact text, title text, country, text static. And primary key will be venue, year. In this case, I'm using a great technique called it a composite partition key. So I have a partition defined by venue and by year. They're combined together to define the partition. So the same venues but from different years will be allocated artifacts from the same venues but from different years will be allocated to different partitions because I want to have my partitions smaller. So in this case, we have these uh, data stacks accelerate year 2019 and a list of the artifacts of them and the country United States. So they will share the partition and another venue in the same year. So that will be different partition because of a composite one having here multiple artifacts within the same partition. That's very important to understand because all the rows within the same partitions are stored together as a single group. And therefore, if you want to retrieve them together, 
We store together what we want to retrieve together. They store it together. If I want to load all artifacts by here, by venue, it will be a one request and one simple query instead of trying to pull data over uh, all of my servers in my cluster. I may have a lot of them. So that's very important to understand things like that. Um, Artyom, there is a great question. Will there be a performance problem if we have a billion partitions for users? So in terms of partitions, we can have as many as we like. Um, essentially, we will just have to scale the cluster, add more nodes so they can handle those billions of partitions. But in terms of rows inside of a partition, there, there are some limitations. So it, you, you usually don't want to have more than 100,000 rows in one partition, but it also depends on the size of each row. How many columns do you have? Is it just two columns or is it 200 columns? So depending on those things, you, the, the situation will change. But in terms of number, number of partitions, you can have as many as you like. Yep. So um, amount of a partitions has no, uh, um, that doesn't anyhow decrease performance. And um, uh, you can have as much partitions as you want. But if you have too big partitions, that's bad because at some point it's getting hard for clusters to for cluster to handle them. So you tend you want to have smaller partitions than <coughs> sorry, bigger partitions. Um, and one more question was about uh, static columns. Uh, Artyom, could you please? Yeah, so it, so it's important to understand from all of this introduction a, a couple of concepts. And, and uh, if I have to name just two, I would say the, the single row partition tables with single row partitions and tables with multi row partitions. So the difference is the uh, Cassandra, Cassandra table looks like relational database table, but this primary key definition is different because it consists of partition key and clustering key. So if clustering key is not there, then you have single row partitions. So which means each partition can only store one row because the partition key uniquely identifies that row. Partition key is a primary key. Then for multi row tables with multi row partitions, you have the clustering key present. So which means in a partition, you can have multiple rows. Be defined. They, they only can be defined for, um, uh, for uh, partitions with multiple rows. And what they mean, the static column uh, uh, describes the partition, the whole partition, not individual rows in that partition. So just to, uh, on, on, on this slide that you have right here, you have the venue and year being uh, the, the partition key. So that's what defines defines a partition. Essentially, this is like a conference. Data stacks accelerate as a conference. Uh, and um, it, it's identified by the, the, the venue name and year. So in this case, the country is a descriptor of that conference, not of the individual artifact stored in the partition. Okay. If we don't make country static, what will happen is that each artifact will have country value. So there will be artifact A, B, C, and so on, and each one will have a, a country value, which is not a big deal, but if you need to update that value, you will have to update all of them, <laughs> and it takes a little bit more space. But in this case, it's a static column. So if you want to update the country, you're going to update it for all artifacts, for the whole partition. So this is what static column is, and we will see more examples again. Yep, thank you. So don't be afraid to ask questions. It's a kind of unique chance uh, to communicate and ask them. Yeah. So in term, I, yep. I see more questions about partition size. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of partition size, it will sometimes depend. Um, the recommendation will depend on the version of Cassandra as well. So um, prior Cassandra C, uh, the, the common recommendation is to have um, um, 100,000 rows 
per partition. That's the, the kind of uh, upper bound, 100,000 or 100 megabytes. So those rows can have different sizes. So it's one of those. So the size of the partition, 100 megabytes, no more, or 100,000 rows. But uh, with, with Cassandra C, the, um, you kind of get in a lot of improvements. So it, sometimes it can be several, um, se several uh, 100,000 uh, megabytes or rows per partition. But it's easy to remember, just rule of 100, 100,000 rows, 100,000 megabytes. Yep. Uh, there is a question. Do you use S3 simple storage service for Cassandra? My answer is only for backups, maybe. It doesn't relate anyhow. Okay. So let's proceed. We have limited time and we still have a lot of things to discuss. Next point. Uh, with the things, uh, as we speak about... Uh, uh, data manipulation language, we have to discuss some important points and some limitations you have to consider. Here we speak about a very simple uh, example, so SQL select, one of the most widely used operation over data to show it. And uh, what's important here? Uh, well, select table name, uh, select what? Some selectors, columns, aggregates or functions including user-defined functions from table name. That must be um, familiar to you. Here comes first very important limitation. Where restricted only to primary key columns. So therefore, to partition keys and to clustering columns. When you create a table, like in this case, we have some table, we have some properties, parts of a primary key, partition key in clustering. So we see here year, and then you are the partition key uh, parts and artifact is the clustering column. What does that mean? By them, we, we, you, we can use them in the uh, where clause so we can filter by them and search by them. But there is also a title, which is text. It's a so-called data column. So we cannot search by data columns as long as we don't have secondary indexes on them, and secondary indexes is a dangerous ground, uh, which I believe we don't cover today. Maybe, uh, Artyom, you would like to say something about indexes, but first I want to finish on the SQL select thing. So, where clause limited only to primary key columns. You cannot use data columns here, and that's very important. You always must provide a partition key. If you don't provide a partition key, what happens then uh, when you have a partition key in your select statement? What happens? It's being calculated into the token on your client side. And then as uh, Cassandra driver is smart, it knows uh, schema allocation, data allocation over the cluster. It even knows which particular servers to ask. So cl your driver, client Cassandra driver will go to the replica a node to get data directly from it. So it's the fastest possible way to um, exclude some ex additional steps required by the uh, remote coordinator node, which doesn't have this data stored. And maybe decrease uh, query time, let's say. But um, if you don't specify the partition, therefore driver cannot calculate the token and driver doesn't know which node to ask. As long as you have free servers, free nodes, it's maybe acceptable. When you have 30, 300, 3000 nodes, you are deep in troubles because in this case, your select statement must go literally to every node keeping this table and ask, hey, maybe you have the data uh, for this uh, query. It's called a full cluster scan. And that's a very, 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 very bad practice. It's so bad practice. So by default, Cassandra drops, denies this request. You don't specify the partition key. I will not do that. Uh, sorry, it doesn't work this way. But with this uh, very bad statement downwards, a low filtering, you can force Cassandra to do so. And there is a big, big red label. Danger. It's a bad practice. If you are responsible for continuous integration, for example, I do suggest you to include check for a low filtering in the code of your application. Uh, because uh, then you may find out what the... 
uh, bad uh, performance of your cluster is was just delivered by some junior developer who added uh, carelessly a low filtering uh, to his code or her code and that that's how cluster now works badly so focus on these kind of things that's important to avoid them Yep, so allow filtering allows you to uh, use data columns uh, in uh, or avoid partition columns in these. Um, uh, yes, allow partition uh, keys in their statement, but it's a very bad practice. And if you uh, have to do use allow filtering, that exactly means what your data model is wrong. When we can group by again primary key columns, order by clustering key columns, ascending, descending, limit. And well, about a low filtering, I said everything actually already. Artyom, maybe you want to add something here? I, th I think keep going. Uh, I, I may uh, have a short summary or maybe ask, uh, maybe answer some other questions. Okay, good. You're done. good. Uh, so, when we have some sample Cassandra query language queries, uh, working with the table we mentioned here, artifacts by venue. Uh, and uh, select all from, well, in general, select all, it's not the best practice, let's say. So mostly we recommend to specify the particular uh, fields you want to retrieve. Uh, but for the demo purposes, it's fine. Uh, we can ask where venue is equal and here equal something. That's we are going to get with wall partition. We specify all the parts of a partition key here and then you. Does that work? Yes, perfectly. Oh, also, we can uh, do it like that then. Then equals something and here equals something and artifact equals something. Will it work? Yes, it will because artifact is a clustering column. So that's fine. And we can also do venue equals, year equals, and artifact more than, artifact less than. That's again fine because it's a clustering column, so it's sortable. Order by artifact. Okay, again, same, it's sortable, so it will work. Then, let's think, let's watch on the bad queries. What's wrong with them and why should you avoid them? Select all from artifacts by venue, same table, but the venue is. Why this uh, query is bad? Answer is simple. Our partition key consists of two parts, venue and year. And we specify only half of this key, therefore token cannot be calculated. And that's the same like uh, to ask without any kind of venue. We have no partition, we have to do full cluster scan, and then that's what you definitely want to avoid. Then, where Vinu and Artifact. Situation is more or less the same. We have Vinu, we have Artifact, but we still don't have year, so token still cannot be calculated. When where Artifact is more and Artifact is less. We can, so we can sort by Artifact, but we still have no Vinu and no year, so it will not work. And Vinu and here and title. Why this one will not work? Venue is uh, given, here is given. What's wrong then? We have our partition key. Answer is simple. Title is a data column. We cannot uh, sort, uh, we cannot search by title because it's a data column. You see, like data, text, nothing. And where country is? It's the same. Country is a static field. We cannot, uh, for us, it like now works like a data column. It will not work. We still need to calculate the partition. So, the most important implications for data modeling you have to consider. First, primary key define data uniqueness. If you have something like city, first name, last name for the users list, it will work well only as long as you have a completely unique person per city. But uh, I guess we have some dozens of John Smiths in New York or something like that. So in this case, uh, it, will be, it will work as an absurd. And every next John Smith will override data of the previous John Smith, what will make them both angry. Uh, obviously, we have to avoid that. There is a way to uh, counteract it with lightweight transactions, 
but we don't cover them today, I guess. Partition keys define data distribution, so how data will be split into groups and therefore distributed over your cluster. Also, partition keys directly affect partition sizes and you do not want to have too big or too hot partitions. Uh, with big partition size, it uh, should be clear. And with uh, hot partitions, I mean when you have two partitions, one is not used at all and second is being used all the time. That's uh, also the thing we are trying to avoid and have them more or less, more or less equally loaded. When clustering keys define row ordering, and that uh, has been said already, if you need uh, ordering within your partitions, then clustering keys are the easiest way to organize that. Speaking of queries, primary keys define how data is retrieved. So we use primary keys and components of a primary keys to retrieve data from them, uh, from the tables. Then partition keys allow only and only equality predicates. If you have uh, your partition key as a year, for example, you can query data like query everything of the uh, partition year 2020. But you cannot do it like partition key uh, smaller than 2021, this will not work. Inequality is not supported for the partition keys. For clustering keys, also, we allow inequality predicates and ordering. And only one table per query, no joins. Now, that looks like a huge set of limitations. Uh, you use it not to have on uh, relational, traditional, multipurpose databases like, I don't know, PostgreSQL, for example. There is, a for a sol there is a solid reason for that. Cassandra is designed to be globally available with multiple data centers, handling petabytes of data, and still delivering answers to you within milliseconds. And under those circumstances, and it works perfectly in these circumstances if your data model is fine, but there is the price to pay, like you cannot have everything at once and for free. And price to pay, there are some limitations. If you work with petabytes distributed globally over United States, Europe and Australia and India, and still getting your answers with milliseconds, you have to pay something for that. Okay. So... Um, to close up the first part, uh, Artyom, maybe you want to add something? Yeah, there were quite a few questions mm -hmm. uh, on different things. Um, there, um, I don't know if I can answer all of them, but uh, in, in, in terms of... Uh, um, so there was one... If, if you can actually share my screen... Yeah, sure. I can, yeah, Give me a moment. Would be, would be useful. Yeah, it makes sense. In terms of when using when to use limit or not to use limit, um, the, the limit will return you partial result of a query. So if it's okay, then by all means use limit and you will uh, uh, speed up processing. But most of the time you want to receive the complete result. So you do, you do not use limit in production in those cases. But um, uh, one very valid use case for limit is when you want to, for example, retrieve the latest um, comment of a user, for example, the most recent uh, order or something like that. That that's in in this case, you have the your orders uh, sorted based on the clustering column, based on timestamp, and then if you retrieve from that partition uh, and say limit one, you retrieve in only one row, which is the most recent. So this is very valid use case for limit in production. Also, I'm on this slide because there was one question. What if, again, about static columns, what if uh, my venue has multiple countries? Then in this case, data stack accelerate 2019 USA, 2019 Europe. Uh, uh, in this case, the partition key will not be just venue and year. The country will have to become uh, part uh, part of the partition key because uh, data sex accelerate 2019 no longer uniquely identifies a venue because it uh, uh, there are two different venues in different countries so you have to 
revise it. But country is still a descriptor of the venue, not of the artifact. Okay, that's what I wanted you to understand. In terms of um, other things, secondary indexes, rarely, but there are use cases for them. Uh, the even allow filtering. Uh, sometimes there are use cases, valid use cases, when you when you know partition key, you go directly to that partition. You know that that partition is small, very few rows there, then you can filter through those rows. Um, and we do support timestamps and all of that. But you can find a lot more information about those concepts uh, in our Cassandra Fundamentals course on datastacks.com slash dev. But now I would like to continue. Uh, sorry, with, uh, may, may I uh, answer? Yeah. Uh, there is a, uh, one uh, very good question I want to answer before we proceed. So, um, of course, Santosh uh, asks, um, boom, boom, boom. So Cassandra alone won't be ideal for OLAP or data analytics. My answer is yes. So Cassandra is not a multipurpose database. Cassandra is more OLTP specific. So online transactions processing. And um, then there is a solid question. Then how do I do any kind of analytics or OLAP queries uh, over Cassandra? Uh, simple answer is Cassandra is... Uh, by al alone, indeed, not the best choice for the ALAP, but of course, uh, there is a great solution. There are multiple solutions. Actually, one of the most popular is to use Apache Spark alongside with Apache Cassandra. So Spark will use uh, Spark will work with the data store it in Cassandra and it will allow you to do any kind of analytics you want to do, any kind of machine learnings uh, with Apache Spark machine learning capabilities. Uh, to train your models and even you can use structured query language over Cassandra uh, with all the foreign keys and joins and so on in Spark. So it's a Spark SQL. Uh, Spark SQL. Uh, this works perfectly and you can have analytics over uh, Cassandra stored data. Uh, one thing uh, you need to have Spark uh, of course so that's uh, one more thing to run and second point is uh, obviously, in this case, you cannot count on um, uh, microseconds uh, answers, let's say. So it will take some longer time to get your data, as it's almost always require full cluster scan. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's your turn now. Yes, and. Um... There are more questions uh, for limit. Limit is never bad. Use limit if, if it works for you um, in, in a query. What is bad there? So the question was, will you, using limit um, with um, to retrieve data from a large partition, is it a bad idea? It's not a bad idea. The bad idea there is to have a large partition. Okay, so just make sure it doesn't have millions of rows there or it has a couple of gigabytes of data. Okay, then large partition is something that you don't want to have. Okay, so let's talk about, um, so the, 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 the review we had is basically allows us to give us uh, some idea, uh, to get some insights of how data is stored there. But data modeling is more than just that. It's, it's more than just schema design and understanding how, this, how those tables works. Uh, data modeling is about uh, collecting business and, and data requirements, um, somehow documenting them, uh, uh, identifying entities, relationships, objects, and, and uh, how they interact. Uh, and they define access patterns, which we usually think about as queries, but can also be uh, updates, inserts, transactions, batch statements, and all of that. And then finally, doing some uh, organization and structuring your data for a particular database like Cassandra and uh, specifying database schema. Okay, so the, the, so far in that introduction, we mostly talked about data, database schema, right? And, and how, those, how to retrieve data from those tables. And then there are optimizations and, and indexing techniques and uh, 
all of that is very important because uh, it will affect data quality. It will make sure affect the completeness of data that you actually store in that everything that is needed will affect consistency and accuracy of your data because you don't want to have uh, um, in one table one value, in another table another value, and things like that. Uh, it will also um, affect data access, uh, like efficiency, scalability is kind of straightforward, but also uh, queryability. If you don't have uh, specific tables to support the query, or you don't have a materialized view or a secondary index, then you will not be able to retrieve that data at all. Okay, so it's very important. And uh, in a nutshell, there are all of those things there. All of those things there, but in a nutshell, there are four objectives that you are looking at. You want to understand the data. Uh, you want to identify access patterns, understand them. Um, you want to apply the query first approach. That's commonly we say how to data model, the, how to design tables is, is based on queries. So this is, you need to understand that query first approach and you need to know about optimization, optimizations and uh, how to implement that. Now, those four objectives, they are kind of, again, make, make, make uh, as easy, it's easier for us to understand those four objectives, four steps, but they actually need to be documented. It's not like, well, how are you going to understand the data? And once you understand it, how are you going to share it with somebody else? So here we have four models that support those objectives. Conceptual data model, application workflow model, logical data model, and uh, physical data model. And those specific models have certain tools that support them, that, that can be used to design those models, so represent, visualize them, like entity relationship diagram for conceptual data modeling, application workflow diagram for application workflow model, Chabotko diagram for logical and physical data models, and of course, CQL that allows us to implement, implement data, database schema at the end. Uh, besides these four objectives, four models, tools, uh, there are two transitions. And those two transitions are usually what is the most difficult part, right? How are you going to go from one model to another? And we're going to briefly touch some of those. We will, we'll see some examples. Uh, but uh, again, this is, this is a large, could be a large topic and uh, you may want to take a course to learn more about it. So the first example, we are, we're going to do it by example. And Alex, if, if there will be any question, please let me know. Um, no, please not yet. Uh, okay. Well, there were a couple of questions, but they're answered already, so let's proceed. We are at the okay. end of the first hour, and we still have a lot of things to do. So let's go on. Yes. Yeah, so the, here's uh, the first example of sensor network or IoT data, smart home type of data. So where we have uh, um, sensors and they, they are grouped together into a network and, and they we collect the data from those sensors and we need to store that data into Cassandra. And then, so that's OLTP part, we are gonna store it and then later maybe we analyze it and, and we do all that part with Spark. So that was relevant related to the questions before. Now you can find all the diagrams for this use case uh, based on that link. You don't need to go there right now, but you know where to find it. So in terms of conceptual data model, we're using entity relationship diagram here. It's independent of database, used for relational databases as well. So it's technology independent. And I'm gonna simply read it for you uh, and, and we'll explain um, a little bit what those uh, elements mean, but I will read it for you and you just follow, um, follow, see how, how it works for you, how, try to understand how I can read it. So the uh, rectangles here represent entity types. So entity type is like a collection of entities. So um, the, the, for example, entity is, is like an object which is a specific sensor that I can physically hold in my hand. But collections of those similar sensors will be called entity type. Okay, so we have entity types, network, sensor, and temperature, and then we have relationship between them, and they those relationships are diamonds, 
And now I'm gonna read this um, uh, diagram. So the network, sensor network, can have many, so this is what this N stands for, many sensors. And I will read in the other direction. The sensor belongs to at most one network. So this is what, what, where this one, what it is doing. It's this one and N called cardinalities. Okay, and then I'm reading the other part. Sensor has many, can take many, oops, sorry. Sensor can take many temperature measurements and each temperature measurement must, uh, is taken by exactly one sensor, okay? So this already tells us some information about uh, how data uh, is organized or how it's modeled. And now network has uh, attributes or descriptors, name, description, region, number of sensors. And name is underlined here, meaning it's it's a key. It uniquely identifies a network. And then for sensor, we have ID, location, and characteristics. ID is a unique key. Location, on the other hand, is a composite attribute consisting of latitude and longitude. So that's something that we can model in Cassandra, translate it into Cassandra, you will see how. And then characteristics is, is double line there, so it means it's a multi-valued attribute. What it translates, so it, there can be multiple characteristics for the sensor, like maybe uh, the precision of the sensor, maybe the range, uh, the, the uh, types of uh, range of measurement that it can take. And uh, so to, when we translate it to Cassandra, it's gonna become a set, a list, a map, and maybe we, we can use uh, user-defined types, types as well. Now, a temperature has timestamp and value. But now timestamp here is a dotted line, um, which means it's a partial key. So the temperature entity type is a weak entity type. And the rec records, sensor records, temperature records is identifying relationship. What it means, basically, that temperature uh, doesn't have a key, uh, the, the attributes that belong to temperature do not form a key. So the key has to be formed based on timestamp and strong entity type um, key, which is ID. So the temperature, the measurement, one measurement will have the ID or key, will have the sensor ID and timestamp. And then you will have the something that uniquely identifies one temperature value, one temperature measurement. Now, relationship types also have keys, and they are not shown here explicitly, but they are easy to, uh, to um, deduce here. So, um, and, and basically, this gives us an uh, unambiguous picture of what kind of data we have, what kind of relationships we have. So the next step in, in that methodology is we need to understand how that data will be used in an application. And this is done with application workflow. It's, it's very simple notation here. We have the tasks, or you can think about them as microservices of some, something else, some kind of computational process. And each one, because it's a data-driven application, each one is supported by a query or access pattern. In this case, all of them are queries. In some cases, can, they can be other types like updates. Now, we have show all sensor networks, that, that's the task, and the query that it needs is finding information about all networks and ordered by name of the network. Then after that, the, based on this workflow, we can go to the task display a heap map for a network, or we can go to display all sensor sensors in a network and then following by the show row measurement values, uh, the raw temperature values for a sensor. And again, there are specific queries. Those queries are important because they will define how, how our tables will look like. But, it, but again, we have this diagram, we kind of organize it, we can share it, we document it, it's a repeatable kind of proce process, okay? And um, again, let's look at those queries because we will use them to design tables. The second query, given network and, and date range, we will retrieve the average, hourly average temperatures. The third query, 
Given network, we will get all the sensors. The force query, given sensor and date range, uh, we will retrieve all the measurements. So when, why is it important? Given the sensor, that's a quality search. And specified date, that, that can be a quality search. But if you, if you do the date range, then it will be inequality. Um, it will be range search, and then you, you, you will have to use clustering key to represent date. So based on that information, based on the data we have on the conceptual data model, based on the application workflow, we basically replacing those tasks with, with tables that support those queries. And this is what, what Chibotco diagram looks like. And uh, we have networks table, which has partition key name and has all the other uh, columns that corresponds to the attributes from um, uh, the other diagram. Uh, we have the temperatures by network. Network is partition key. Date is clustering column. Uh, and, and it is um, in descending order. Descending has descending clustering order. Now, hour is another clustering column, and sensor is ascending clustering column. So there are two more tables, and it should be easy to understand what they are, right? The table name columns, these characteristics columns is a map, and uh, we have a partition key network, sensor, clustering key, and we have two regular columns okay and and those tables are designed based on mapping rules right? like and and uh, mapping patterns that we're not going to touch here because we we don't have enough time but you just see an example of of the final result of mapping conceptual and, and application workflow to this logical data model okay and the physical data model does so it, again, the second transition from logical to physical, and it does two things. It defines data types. It defines whether you need a material, whether you're going to use a secondary index or materialized view. In this case, we're not using any, but it, that, we do have all the data types for all the columns. So, for example, these characteristics is now we can uh, we define it as a map of text and text, and it does use some optimizations. So in this case, we use three optimizations that are kind of common optimizations. So uh, let's go back to logical and uh, understand how, why those optimizations are even needed and, and um, how, I, how we can come up with them. So first of all, when you look at each table that you came up with to support the query, you uh, look at the couple of things. First, if this table supports a query, how many partitions is it going to retrieve? So our query one get all the networks that we have. This table has a, a name of the network as a partition key. So to retrieve all the networks, we will essentially will retrieve we will retrieve all partitions in this all rows or all partitions in this table. It's a table with single row partitions. So whenever you want, uh, when, so whenever you see the situation when you retrieve many partitions per query, then you try to optimize. You want to retrieve as less partitions as possible, preferably just one partition per query. Okay, so this is where the optimization comes from. What would be the new partition key? How do I put all the networks into the same partition so I can retrieve them all at once from one partition? We come up with this bucket, but it's a basically dummy column that will store, it's a new partition key, and all the networks will be uh, uh, part of that partition. They will be separate rows in that partition. So we made that single row partition table to table with multi-row partitions. So that's the first optimization. The second one is a simple one. Um, we can always take the date and hour and, and come up with a timestamp, use timestamp, and we can easily combine them together so we don't need two columns. We just have one column with date and hour. And another less trivial is, um, another type of analysis is for large partitions, okay? So in this case, if we, if we look at this uh, table, 
how large the partition will be, how many rows will I have in that partition. So I need to have some assumptions about my data. So for example, so the, each partition is essentially identified by the network. So uh, in my sensor network, one individual network, how many um, sensors will I have? For example, if I have 100 sensors, that's my maximum, for example, or average. But usually you, you want to look at the worst case, so maximum. So if I have 100 sensors, uh, so how many values, temperature values, for example, will be generated by that network? Okay, so it will be every hour I will generate 100 rows, 100 values, 100 rows, every hour. So in, in one day, there are 24 hours, so I'm getting 2,400 um, values. And then that uh, 2,400 rows in that one partition. And then because my network is deployed somewhere and I'm not touching it, I'm collecting data, and maybe it, it's gonna run, it's gonna collect data for many years, right? So th the partition will grow, the size of the partition will go, there will be more and more rows in that partition. So and it will at some point become too large. So I want to limit the growth. How do I do that? How do I limit the growth of the partition? Or how do I split the partition into smaller partitions? I change, I either change one of the columns to become a partition key, or I introduce some new partition key. In this case, I introduced weak. So the uh, base on the uh, the week is now part of the partition key it's now composite uh, com uh, composite partition key consisting of network and week so for every new week i will start a new partition for that for that network and that is going to cap the size of how big the partition can be it's going to be just 7 days and each day i'm collecting 2400 Rose. Yep, I, okay. I want to step in here for a second uh, with a real life example. We had very similar story uh, with one of our clients. I will call no names, but for the similar task, we didn't do bucketing and having only uh, sensor and timestamp uh, for the um, data storage. And in the beginning, it all was very good. But as every sensor reports its states every few seconds, over months it became too big and partitions became too big. Uh, so with this bucketing, uh, with week number uh, or week date uh, in this case, uh, it's perfectly fine. Uh, you are, your partitions will never be too big because as soon as a week is over, boom, you have a new partition and you are good. So that's automated regulation on the partitions, which is kind of cool. Yep. So actually, this temperature by sensor table, if date was not, uh, if, if, if it was not a part of the partition key, then sensor would collect those measurements uh, indefinitely and the partition will keep growing and growing and growing. So that's why date is there as part of the partition key. Uh, but also because the query ask the, uh, the, 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 the ask queries. Uh, uh, specifically wanted the date to be equal to something, so support equality search. Okay, there are other types of analysis which may be less common, but for example, duplication, right? Because we're duplicating the uh, data here, the latitude and longitude mentioned here in this table, but also mentioned here in this table, okay? So, um, we have a hands-on for you, which essentially what it does, it has these tables created in um, in Cassandra, and those queries in Express and CQL. There will be sample data set as well. Um, do you have any questions before we proceed? Uh, not really. There are more general questions regarding our databases and uh, guidelines uh, for the partition size when partition is getting too large. Okay, so this is where you get, uh, so the catacata.com data stacks in 10 slash fab slash 2021. Somebody please post it in the chat. This is where we have the, uh, our three examples that we plan to cover today if we 
will be able to do that based on time. But this is the first one. Let's look at the first one. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. Um, you can just follow the uh, this short demo that I'm gonna do it for you. But also, you can you can actually, if you want, you can uh, uh, sp spend time start your own instance. Okay. So uh, the first thing we like we said in the beginning. All the schema will be part of the key space. All the tables will be in some key space. We define in key space with name sensor data. Okay. So it already exists. Did I run it previously? Let me. Are we sharing the same key space or not? Uh, let me check. Okay, so I'm gonna create these uh, tables that we defined there on the diagram. And you can see the the going from the diagram to the tables is quite easy, right? Uh, it's basically the same column names, data types. Uh, the primary key definition contains contains partition key and um, clustering key. Okay, let's load some data with a script and then select the data and see how it looks like. So this is what uh, this is the table uh, networks. We have all the networks in the same bucket, with, which is like a dummy bucket with uh, identifier all. It can be something else. So we have some forest network and forest fire detection uh, network and volcano monitoring network in this data set. And um, let's look at the second table. The, it's a uh, temperature by network. This one will be interesting because we introduced this week as part of the partition key. So how are we gonna query this table? Queries, introducing something to partition key will also mean that the queries will be become a little bit more complex because now they may sometimes access multiple partitions. Sensors by network, this is how they look like. This is that map which has accuracy and sensitivity to keys, to key value pairs there. And then temperatures by sensor, given uh, for example, this sensor, we can find all the um, dates and timestamps and values. Okay. Now, um, the first query is going to be simple. We are going to retrieve uh, all the columns from table networks where bucket equals all, and we get the result. So we're going to work with ForestNet, which is, has three sensors. Okay. So this this query now retrieves one partition to answer your um, the, 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 to answer the the question that we had. Right. Now this one is a little bit more interesting. We are going to find hourly average temperatures for every sensor in network ForestNet and and specific date range which falls under this week of 2020-0705. So this is how the query looks like. Right? We have the, we specify the network, we specify the week, that's the partition key, and then we use range search with inequality predicates here for the date and hour, because those are clustering columns, we can do that. We cannot do inequality on week or on network, those are partition key columns. Okay, but what happens if the date range that I choose is gonna fall, it's not gonna be within a specific week, but maybe span two weeks. So this is exactly the second one, the second uh, question here. There is uh, one range, uh, but it falls uh, within, uh, within the two weeks um, that start with different days. So you can do either two separate queries where you specify two different week identifiers, which is just at the beginning of the day, of the, uh, the, the date that starts the week. So you can do that, okay? And then you can also combine it into one query, and in one query, if you do that, you will simply use in 
in operator with weak and you specify the weak has to be either that one or, or the other one. So which is, which is less work and this is an example where you can use in, right? Sometimes we say don't use in because it's going to be multi-partition query. This is a valid example where you will use it because we used bucketing, we used weak as a bucket, now we're retrieving data from two buckets. It's a nice query. And then the, the third query, get all the sensors in network forest net, quite easy. The queries are easy. If you design your, your tables correctly, the queries will be very straightforward. And then the next one, get all the raw measurements for the specific uh, uh, date and specific sensor. So we are getting for this sensor S100C, we're getting this result. And of course, this is a toy, toy data, so it's a small result. But all those rows, again, we retrieve it from one partition. Well, from one partition. Each time we retrieve data, we want to access as, as small a number of partitions as possible. And most of the time, it's just one partition. Okay, and we finish this one, right? We finish this one, and we can start next scenario. But uh, that's gonna be something that Alex yep. is gonna yep. cover. Yeah. So, do you have any any questions about this example? Not exactly. Um. So, uh, there is a question. Uh, pretty painful question, I would say. Uh, give me a second to switch off. So, yes. Uh, so, what is bucketing? There is an, yeah, that's the first question. What is bucketing? And I believe that's uh, we, we will repeat it in a second. Uh, better question uh, if there is a white partition, is there any alternative over than redesign? In short, if you uh, found out uh, what your partitions are too big already, so in general, best way to avoid big partitions is to think ahead. That's like um, just uh, prepare for that and design your data model properly. That's not always possible. Uh, patterns are changing, data, ch data is changing, uh, business is changing, and then you, at some point, uh, you find out yourself uh, with um, partitions too big and you want to do something uh, with that. Uh, Artem, what would you suggest uh, in this case? Well, you have to, for so large partitions, not white, that's a yeah. different term. Large partition um, is a partition with over 100,000 rows, or which is over 100 megabytes. So think about this, we are designing OLTP database we are going to serve queries and it probably will return the result to somebody, maybe to, to end user, maybe to uh, somebody internally. Uh, and, and, but most of the time we design an application that is user facing. Are we gonna retrieve 100 megabytes of data or 100,000 rows that mean something and give it to the user? That's not gonna be an OLTP type of query, right? So you kind of, thinking about those queries that, that uh, in advance and, and uh, if you need that many uh, rows and it's probably not an OLTP application. If you already got into, uh, in, into a situation where for some reason the, what, there was one worst use case you didn't consider, some user, so you're storing all user comments in one uh, partition and then some user decided that he, he made a goal to create 100,000 comments on the, on the website and, and achieved it, and you have a large partition in that case, then you basically have to split that partition for, for that user. And splitting partitions, meaning that you had one partition, now you're gonna create multiple partitions. And that's what sometimes those smaller partitions are called buckets, and that's why what, what bucketing is. Right, and then how do you split? Well, you, you make that partition key more selective, okay? So it, it, it's, it's not gonna be just user ID anymore, but maybe it's gonna be user and video ID, or maybe it's gonna be user and date. So the, the user or months or week, 
so the, the time component is used frequently for bucketing, but in some cases it can be even artificial value. It can be one, two, three, four, five, or can be UUID, but you will have to, uh, if you're gonna use artificial one, you will have to have a separate table that lists those artificial values. So it's user, this user has these buckets so that you can later retrieve, okay, for this user, I have these hundred buckets and then I'm gonna retrieve that just the first five, the latest five or something like that. Uh, but yeah, you have no choice, but you have to split split partitions and that's what bucketing is. Yep, perfect. So I think we are good to go to the next steps. What do you think? It looks like questions are answered. Many thanks to our helpers, supporters on the YouTube and in Discord. And when we can yeah. go on. Okay. So, uh, then the second example we work on today is the investments portfolio data. data. Well, uh, first of all, about the domain we are talking about. I guess uh, nowadays everyone have heard of these stories of GameStop and uh, over uh, stocks uh, who went very high to go when very low, doesn't matter. Uh, we are going to design a data model for the investment portfolio. So the set of um, stocks and other options a person can buy and sell and own. So we are kind of developing a data model for a um, broker uh, who is going to deliver. So here we have an example of uh, some the typical view you may have in uh, these kind of uh, brokers. Uh, we are going to operate with four main ideas here. User, well, very simple. It's someone who opens an account and uh, one user can open multiple accounts and account has some trades done so any operation when you buy something or sell something is a trade and it can be or buy or sell and every trade involves one and one instru only one instrument and instrument can be a stock a mutual fund or an etf uh, share exchange trade fund uh, share so in sh in shorter user can open account and using this account he or she can make uh, he can buy or sell some instruments and this instrument can be stock or mutual fund or etf what the typical ideas for the user is a username and name we will not cover anything additional for this example that should be enough user opens an account account has account id cash balance because you may have some not invested uh, cash balance on the account may have some investment value and total value they are ephemeral and tend to change very quickly so we will not uh, store them in cassandra and they mention it just for clarity here it means it's overall value of my uh, account with all the um, instruments bought and uh, cash balance uh, left in this account. What is the trade? Is an operation of buy or sell. What includes every every trade consists of ID, shares, price, and date, amount and date. And uh, instrument. So something what I own as a result of a buy is a symbol. So uh, let's say here. ID and uh, amount of them like as much of them I have so as said it can be or stock or mutual fund or ETF and I have multiple instruments on my account and I ha can have multiple accounts when we have to uh, cover the ways and workflows how we are going to use these data. First one, we have to show accounts of a user. So I'm a user, I'm logging in. I'm going to have to see the list of my accounts if I have multiple. So we have to find information about all investment account of a user. That's the first one. I'm logging in, I want to see my accounts, very clear. 
Second one, uh, when I'm selecting one of the accounts, clicking on it, we are going to display all positions, all what I own in this account. So all the instruments I've bought and didn't sell uh, before, every, all my assets. And uh, last point we want to uh, highlight here, I want to display account trade history as a customer uh, to understand uh, recent operations, to review recent operations. I want to display account trade history. First two cases are very simple. I doubt if there will be any users having hundreds or thousands of accounts. Usually you have one, maybe two, three, but not more. Not, not, uh, not dozens, let's say. Then, uh, display positions uh, in an account. Well, that's pretty clear. This can be a big table, this can be a short table. Uh, for those who prefer to invest in stocks, it can be like a long, long list of different stocks. If you are using ETFs, uh, that may be like uh, some of them, like, I don't know, 5, 10, depending on your strategy. But there can be some. They are limited. There aren't billions and billions of them, usually, at least. And for the display account trade history, it's a longer and more complicated operation. Well, not operation, but more, let's say, use case, because I want to um, see the um, history based on different scenarios. The first scenario we cover is find all trades done for an account, order by trade date, most recent first. So that's a simple scenario. I want just to see all my trades, most recent first. Uh, but that's not the only one we have to cover. We need to find all trades for an account and a date range order by trade date. So I want to filter operations for the specific date range. For example, show me all my operations for the December of year 2020. Pretty simple. Then I want to find all trades for an account, date range and transaction type, buys or sells, order by trade date. Again, so it's the same, but now I introduce a filter of operation, operation type. Finally, uh, I want to find all trades for an account, date range, transaction type and instrument symbol. So now I want to see all operations regarding one particular stock or one particular exchange trade fund. And finally, uh, the scenario number 3.5, find all trades for an account, date range and instrument symbol ordered by trade date. So there is a pretty lot of the data access patterns, but they can be grouped somehow. Let's take a look what we can do with that. Talking about logical data model, we start to think about the following list uh, of um, um, entities, accounts, trades, positions. Uh, that's how it looks using Chibotko diagram. And let's uh, see how it looks for us. So for the first use case, account by user, idea seems to be very simple. Username as a partition key. It really makes sense. I will mostly probably never have my partitions too big because I doubt if customer will open uh, billions, uh, more than 100,000 of uh, accounts and if he, if he is or she is, even in this case, we may put an application level uh, limitation on that. So we will not allow to open more than 100 accounts, for example. Then account number, that's a clustering column. Uh, cash balance as an integer, well, that's more for physical data model, but we at logical data model, we don't think of these kind of things. And name, uh, just the name of the account, uh, so person could name them somehow, uh, just for clarity again. Uh, for the positions by account, we are going to have a table to show first uh, account uh, as a partition key, then symbol of uh, so what particular stock or uh, ETF is stored here and the quantity, how many of them we have. And finally, we are talking about uh, four uh, units for us, four tables for us to access tables by account and date, 
trades by account type and date, trades by uh, symbol, by account symbol, type and date, and so on. Uh, they are very similar. So all those tables are just to show the history of the, all the operations. Within the microseconds, we want to get them very, very, very quickly. And uh, that's, kinda, that's again how denormalization works. So we are going to, when we store, when we store data, we are going to put it into multiple tables. And it kind of makes our work harder when we store data, but it's not so big deal because anyway, we are going to execute those asynchronously. That's fine. And, uh, but in the end, when customer opens an account, we are able to show history of uh, the trades in 15 microseconds, dispatching response immediately, and they are pre-sorted already. To understand how they are pre-sorted, that's another story. We have to understand write path and read path of a Cassandra. I will not touch that right now. That's closer to the operations part, but that's what good for everyone to know, everyone using Cassandra, what data is pre-sorted on insert time, on write time. And then in read time, I don't waste my time sorting uh, if I'm using those uh, clustering columns, uh, sorting order. So, as a next step, don't forget from logical, so first from entities and uh, workflows, we go then to logical data model and then to physical data model using the same Chibatko diagram. It's kind of a weird feeling, Artyom, to explain how do you use Chibatko diagram uh, <laughs> with you on the workshop. <laughs> but okay. Um, so, uh, and now we start to think on the physical data layer. So, what does that mean? Physical data model layer uh, of this uh, data modeling um, methodology makes us think already at the level of the particular data types we are going to use. So, as you see, we are using our already, already real types. And the second thing is the switching from logical, proceeding, not switching, from logical to physical uh, makes us able to apply some improvements and make some optimizations. For example, here we think what for every uh, operation in the history, we need to have date when it happened, date time when it happened, and also trade ID. And we need them both because we every trade must have an unique ID, but also we need to know when it happened, always up to uh, microseconds. As a result, we apply here physical optimization. We are having trade ID only one column of the time UUID data type. Time UUID is a great thing, so you can have universally unique ID, this long, long, long string, you've seen that already, but it has. Uh, the time integrated the thin, and you can uh, put time into UUID, if it's a time UUID, of course. You can extract time from time UUID, and you can sort it, and it will be sorted by time. So that's an ID with time integrated. And that's great, that's a very convenient tool. For example, for um, account, I don't need that, because for account, account number will be just text. I don't need to sort accounts by time. It makes no sense. But for trades, I definitely must be able to sort them by time. And that's here I have account text as a partition key to group them by the accounts and trade ID as a time UUID as a clustering column. It gives me uniqueness. Altogether, they built a primary key, which is the unique, but also it gives me this sortability ability to sort them based on the time, which is essential for my reporting tool, because I can jump in and see all my operations sorted by time and they are pre-sorted. Uh, mostly the same idea goes for the uh, other tables for the reporting. And we have here clustering uh, column always by the account, oh, sorry, clustering. We have partitioning, uh, partition key always by the account, sure. Uh, but also we have uh, different clustering columns. So for type and date, we will have type and trade ID because it's time also. And for symbol type and uh, trade, we will have 
therefore uh, simple type and trait as the clustering columns and so on. So that's the general idea. Uh, here we have uh, here we have uh, uh, used all of our queries identified before all of our workflow units we identified before. We want to show investments accounts of a user. We want to display position in the accounts. We want to display account trade history. Q1, Q2, Q3. And in this page we see Q1, that's our table to display accounts. Q2, to display the positions by the account. Q3, boom, 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 to display the history of the operations. Uh, speaking of hands-on portfolio uh, for investment, it's going to be pretty easy. There, there was another question, Alex, yeah, sure. that, um, uh, that that is very interesting uh, from Chris Kapoor. Um, so, what happens um, if I need if my access pattern, my query, is to find all trades for a specific instrument, like specific symbol? Uh, across all accounts. So if we go back um, to, to the diagram. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Right? So, so we, we just have a symbol and we need to get all the trades. What do we do in that case? Um, so the, this, is clear, this is clearly for analysis. You're retrieving that, that type of data because you're going to retrieve a lot. There will, there will be thousands, millions of trades per day. right? And we are not limiting the date. Right, so what, what, what can we do? What, how are we going to approach that query? So the simplest um, uh, idea could be, uh, okay, let's create a new table where we organize trades by symbol and symbol will be partition key and then uh, there will be um, the account as a clustering column or, or trade ID will be clustering column and things like that, right? So, but the point is in that partition you will have a lot of rows and then you decide maybe I can split it and so on but that's that's not the right approach that's the, the straightforward idea but it's not the right approach uh, the reason is because you're trying to retrieve a lot of data for analysis so and we're designing OLTP database here so the right approach would be to first have two data centers one is going to going to be responsible for a real-time OLTP uh, transactions. The other one will be responsible for analytics. Why do we want to have two data centers? Is because we don't want your analytical query to affect our uh, uh, performance of our OLTP transactions. Right? So we're going to replicate data, the same tables, exactly the same tables, into two data centers. When we define key space, we're going to specify Okay, this is the, uh, the the replication for operational data center, a replication for uh, analytical data center. And then what are we going to do there with analytical data center? We will also have Spark there. And to retrieve all data for, for all trades for a specific symbol, we can do two things. Uh, uh, one, we can simply take one of these four tables that starts with trades, all of them have the same data, but organized differently. So take one of them and just use Spark to retrieve and, and filter all the data from the table based on symbol. So that's one approach. The other approach would be to use, um, uh, to still define a secondary index. This is a good use case for secondary index to define it on a symbol uh, column of, for example, the first table trades by AD. Um, so define the secondary index there and use that secondary index only in the um, uh, in the analytical data center. The data center. So when when you retrieve data with Spark, uh, the, the Spark is going to use that index automatically for you because there is a Spark Cassandra connector that knows about schema indexes and so on. So so hope that answered your question. Maybe longer. Than you expected, but it was kind of loaded question. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, yeah, sure, it takes some time, but it's a very good question, and good questions deserve uh, good uh, good answers. So thank you so much. Um, I have a suggestion. We have only twenty minutes left, 
and uh, I would suggest to skip for now investment portfolio data modeling example on Katakoda for a very simple reason. Uh, we have much more important uh, step, uh, much more important example to do. And um, I suggest you to do this investment portfolio uh, step uh, practice on your own using the link they provided. And if you will have any questions, find us at um, bit.ly slash Cassandra dash workshop. It's in the description of the um, video. And uh, we will answer questions there, okay? I think it makes sense to switch to the next one. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's that's going to be awesome. Yep. The, the only thing I would like to mention while you're sharing my slides, right? Uh, so will you be able to share my slides? In a moment? Yes, please. Boom, you're welcome. Yeah. So the only thing I wanted to mention for the hands-on, the second link that we're using here is for workshops specifically, which allows us to have 100 concurrent users. Uh, but the, the first link where we refer to specific course is, is the link that you can use after the workshop. So most likely not all of you will use it at the same time and there will be enough capacity there to um, in, enough infrastructure to cover all of you. So um, the next one is order management um, example, uh, use case. And essentially, we're going to track orders and the statuses of those orders. Why is it even interesting? Because when, so you, you have a status like order shaped, delivered, but you also have status like canceled. And you also have the, uh, a bunch of other statuses in between. We are going to make it simple. We don't, we don't need to have dozens of those statuses, but the whole thing is you can not, for example, cancel uh, an order that has, has been delivered already, right? So you will have to do the return versus cancel. So that means um, you kind of have to do the conditional updates there. And they are called compare and set operations. So they're called lightweight transaction in Cassandra. And we're going to see an example how and when to use it. So this is the, the use case we're dealing with. But we are actually, this diagram is maybe a little bit larger than, than we need for this particular example, because uh, we basically have multiple systems here. We have user who may have multiple shopping carts and uh, those shopping carts contain items and uh, then user has payment methods. And of course, if, if uh, there, there can be many of them, but each payment method belongs to one specific user. So the payment method is going to be identified by both user and some kind of summary. So for simplicity, we just use summary details. And then user has address and those addresses, uh, again, uh, can have multiple addresses and, and that the address has uh, belongs to exactly one user and identified by summary and ID of the user. And they, there is a delivery option. And then how order uh, uh, happens, right? It it's a, happens during checkout process. And this is more complex relationship type here, right? It has multiple entity types, multiple entity types involved here. So uh, the shopping cart is used to place the order during checkout process. The payment method will have to be specified. The address will have to be specified, but actually two of them, one for shipping, one for billing. They can be the same, they can be different, but you can see two lines and we actually wrote shipping and billing, which are actually called roles, role of an address in this relationship type. So just easier for us to understand what those two addresses are uh, for. So the one is for shipping, one is for billing. Delivery option and finally order. Order has ID, status, timestamp, these dash, dash attribute types, subtotal, shipping handling, tax, total. Dash means it's a derived one. So subtotal is computed based on the price, prices of the items and their quantity. 
and then uh, shipping and handling will depend on the address and and the weight and um, the tax will depend again on on the on, on the allocation of the warehouse and so on and then there is a total which add them up so derived attributes on the conceptual data model are important because sometimes you may decide to compute them in uh, like dynamically in your application and never store into your database and sometimes you can decide okay i'm going to store them into my database and uh, if, uh, and uh, that that will depend on how that data is used okay and then we have uh, order status history, which of course does not exist without order. The, we need to have order, and there will be timestamp and status the, uh, the recorded for that history. And then the, each history entry, status entry will have will be identified by timestamp of that entry and ID of the order. Okay. So in kind of quick terms. Uh, I described this diagram and, and you can read more um, in, in the link that we provided in the beginning of the, this use case. But um, also I wanted to mention that the shopping cart, we're not going to use it here, but there is another example which uses shop, shopping cart. So it models basically this part of the diagram. And as you can imagine, the payment system the shipping system can be separate system. They they uh, like delivery system with maybe even external system. So those will have se separate either databases or separate uh, kind of uh, uh, people responsible for working with those. Now um, the application workflow we will keep it simpler than the diagram. We have we need to show orders placed by a user. We need to display information about one specific order and, and we will sort items by name in that order. And um, we can we will show orders placed by a user containing a specific item. So that that's like for a given user, uh, uh, which orders this user place over long or, period of time that contain, for example, uh, uh, a cell phone or in our case that there will be different types of products. But um, that would be just interesting, maybe even just to see, OK, when I order this particular item uh, and wh whether I need it to reorder or what is the frequency of ordering for me and things like that. Then show an order status history and then cancel an order. So this cancel an order is is really cool because it's different than, than anything else that we've seen before, right? It's the update uh, access pattern. And why is it interesting? Um, you will see very shortly right, on this diagram. So to support those access patterns, we have these uh, define these tables on the diagram and we uh, we can see that, well, the first one is orders by user, user ID is partition key, then the order timestamp is just for ordering and the order ID is for uniqueness, right? And those are uh, order timestamp, order ID is a clustering key, composite clustering key. The orders by ID is quite straightforward. We have order ID, we have um, each row will, will be a separate item. So it will have a name for sorting, right? That was a requirement and it will have item ID and then we have item description, price, item quantity, and so on. But then we have many static columns. And static columns tells us that we are describing, describing order, not individual item in this table. Right? So it's going to be order status, order timestamp, subtotal, order shipping, tags. So those derived uh, attribute types, we decided that we're going to store them because they are not going to change. Once they are computed, they will not change. We don't need to update those values uh, later. So this is like a history of the order. And then you can see that the, we will store this billing summary and details, shipping and uh, payment and delivery. They all describe information about order, not specific item within that order. Okay, and then order by user item orders by user item. So we will use user ID and we will use uh, item ID as a partition key. And uh, 
uh, order timestamp will be clustering column, order ID will be another clustering column. So for, for given user and given item, we will have a partition where each row will have the timestamp of the order for ordering and uh, for sorting, right? And the order ID, which defines that which order was we place that, uh, that, that, that specific user place order for that item. Okay, and you can see in this table there are no regular columns. It's all of them part of the primary key, either partition key or clustering key columns. And then the interesting part, the most interesting part, I think for this example, is we have update. We need to cancel order, but the order status needs to be updated to cancel in three tables. Right? There is order status in here, orders by user. There is one in here, order status history by ID. And there is um, order status here in orders by ID. How do we do that? How do we do that correctly? Okay, we will see. So in terms of physical optimization, there are none. We don't need to optimize everything. If we do this careful analysis, we don't have time to discuss each one. But if you if we analyze, the user is not going to place hundreds uh, uh, the, the order with 100,000 of items. The user is unlikely to place in a lifetime 100,000 orders either, right? This, the number of statuses for for an order will be limited, and, uh, uh, and then the, the number of times one specific user orders the same item will also be limited, will be less than the number of total number of orders by the user. So the this update is the most interesting part. So I'm gonna show you quickly, okay how this specific update is done. Okay. So I'm going to create my tables and they look exactly like those tables on the diagram, but the diagram is so much easier to read and uh, explain to somebody than the CQL code itself. I will load some data. So I have these uh, orders by the user. You can see different statuses here, delivered, pending. Um, I have, this is by the way, interesting. So this is the uh, orders by ID. There are many columns here. So how do I display it instead of ver uh, horizontally those columns? I'm gonna display it vertically using this expand on and I will turn it off. But essentially this is one row 12, for example, and these are the columns. So this is row ID, this is the item name, hazelnuts, this is ID, this is the description price, and all those static columns that uh, uh, have information about the order. Okay, so you can, you can use this trick to display uh, uh, information for the, for the row where there are many columns, for the table where there are many columns. Orders by user item. So for example, Joe here ordered the same item three times. Okay, three different orders. And the last one, the, the history, right? So we have the all the information here. So the history table contains, doesn't update the status. It simply inserts new status with a new timestamp. But the other two table, they only keep one status, current status. So they will update the status column. So given the time limit we have, let me jump to the, the most interesting part, to the update. Okay. So we are gonna cancel order with specific ID placed by specific user on that date and, and uh, Time, so essentially timestamp of the order by updating its status from pending to canceled. So it's important that we are only allowed to update it from pending to canceled. We cannot update it from delivered to canceled, for example, or shipped to canceled. We cannot do that because that canceling at that point is not possible. You have to return. Uh, so to do that, we will have to use um, 
lightweight transactions, tra lightweight transaction to make sure, okay, to make sure that the uh, we change in the order status to cancelled, okay, where this is the ID of the order if order status is currently pending. So what? Why is it important? Is because well. Uh, I, I decided to cancel my order, but the shipping department has decided to ship it, and we're doing it at the same time, right? And because it can current access to, to the same piece of data, and what happens is I think I canceled it, but the shipping department didn't know, and they override my canceled with shipping, and we have a problem there, right? The, the state of the database doesn't reflect the real uh, situation of what just happened. So only one will be able to, so if shipping department updates it to shipping, I will not be able to cancel it anymore uh, because the, the, the order is being shipped. Okay, and uh, if I update it from pending to cancel, the shipping department will not be able to ship because it's no longer pending. Okay, so this is done with this simple update with if statement. So what happens if I click it? Okay. So it says that we were able to apply that transaction because it was pending and now it's canceled. So uh, what happened here, I selected this table, orders by ID, the main table, as a source of truth table. I'm not updating all three rows at the same time. I'm updating only one, all, not all three tables, but only one table. And then after I succeeded with this source of truth table, I'm updating the other two with regular inserts and updates. Uh, update and insert. So there is no lightweight transactions, they are just regular updates. And then I can check all three tables they were I, wa I was able to update. Now, if I try to do update again, for example, I'm running the again. First, my goal is to, do, uh, to, to deal with a single source of truth table and it falls. I cannot change it because it's no longer pending, it's already canceled. So in, in this case, my application should know that it should not run these two updates either. Now, the, I anticipate a question, why not we use a batch statement here because we're updating three tables and we can do it in, in a start, uh, begin batch, end batch type of uh, CQL uh, statement, right? So if you don't know, if you haven't heard about batches, we have in Cassandra Fundamentals course, we have information, more information about that. But I cannot and don't want to do it with a batch um, for two reasons. I cannot put all three of them into a batch because um, this, this batch is going to span three different partitions in three different tables. So I cannot use lightweight transaction there. So lightweight transaction within a batch can be used only for single partition batch. And so I cannot do that, but then uh, how about using batch for the, for the other two, for the other two updates, update and insert. It's possible, but usually um, I don't want to use a batch for um, multi partition update insert. So for, Multi-partition batches is usually something that I prefer not to use because um, of uh, because they are not isolated, unlike the um, uh, single partition batches. They are not isolated and they are also uh, much less efficient. Single partition batches can be actually more efficient than just regular than just two separate statements here. But um, in our case. But this is this. They both uh, each statement updates different partitions. So I'm just using them like that. And uh, if there is any problem with one of those updates or insert, I will simply retry. And uh, there is no need for a batch here. But there are valid use cases for batches. If you're interested, again, um, you will be able to find in additional resources that Alex is going to describe soon. Okay. Do we have any questions? Um. Only one left, I would say. Uh, first of all, people are excited regarding this expand on statement. <laughs> uh, but regarding the questions, um, does it benefit the input output costs to have limit one uh, in the query, even if we use the on 
on a specific order ID. It's on YouTube. Okay. It, it does benefit. So, yeah. It does benefit. So, uh, with Slim, it, it basically the uh, in, in multi uh, role partition, basically the clustering key that uniquely identifies a role uh, is used as an index. You can think about it, it, it as an index. And um, it, it will benefit because the internally the partition doesn't necessarily will be um, like, like uh, so it will still be uh, stored possibly on different in different uh, locations uh, uh, consecutive but different sectors on this or something like that so yeah if you use limit it's gonna it's gonna help uh, I saw another question possibly if you have a large partition and you only retrieve in uh, subset of rows using um, inequality search on clustering key um, and that yeah that may be uh, possible it's it's it it may cut costs um, and and again with those large partitions um, you have to its number of rows is not always everything uh, the size of each row is important as well so uh, the with Cassandra's fee, there were tests I've seen that th there were over a million rows and it was still doing fine for time series where the, the, the size of the of values were not big. Okay. Uh, yep. Uh. The expand on is not a new feature. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, you can you can use it. Uh, and in, in I the, guess that's Apache Cassandra, not Data Stack Enterprise. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Apache uh, version, not uh, Data Stack specific. Correct. Um, a couple of more questions. Thanks, David. So, how do we pull OLTP data using Extract Transform Load uh, ETL tools like Informatica? How do you do ETL with uh, the OLTP data of ours. Well, I, I'm not familiar with Informatica, but essentially, uh, to so extract transform loan, right? So the 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 first step is extract. So you need some kind of type of connector. Is there a connector or is there a, a, specific instrumentation in Informatica that allows you to specify connected to Cassandra like driver, Java driver or DBC, JDBC driver that will allow you to pull the data and then do the transformation within Informatica or something else. If not, then maybe you can still, uh, if it's a large piece of data, you can still use Spark, pull the data, extract it from, from Cassandra, um, then uh, do the transformation with Spark and then um, you, you 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 have specific tools for Informatica to load that data, um, or maybe you just use bulk loader to unload the data from Cassandra into files, and then you do some transformation using some other tool, maybe even your custom script. So there there can be a lot of possibilities yes. there, but but it's not it's not it's not something that is not achievable. It's definitely achievable, but there are different ways to go. Some of them can be more complex, some of them will be less complex. Uh, to uh, extract, uh, one of the uh, tools was available, one of the good tools was available only for data stacks enterprise was DSBulk, but now it's also um, uh, works with Apache Cassandra, so you can use it for Apache Cassandra as well uh, to get your data and then process it in any kind you want, uh, so it's not be. Um, so, uh, Igor uh, Storozhev asks, is materialized view still not recommended? Uh, so, first I will give my answer. Materialized views are considered experimental, but they are turned it on in Cassandra version 4 and you can use them. There's a bit of a dangerous grounds because, um, let's say, I know some success stories with parameterized views. I know some not so success stories <laughs> with parameterized views. Um, 
so it's definitely something you have to be uh, careful about. Uh, what's the biggest problem as far as I know at this moment of the time? Take a look. When you have, um, when you store your data, when you insert the data and you have replication factor free and one of your uh, partitions, one of your replicas don't get the message for any reason, doesn't matter what has happened, uh, if there are a lot of tools to uh, defend you from inconsistency. Uh, repair on read, uh, hinted handoffs, uh, scheduled repairs, and so on and so forth. So even if you run into inconsistency, there are simple ways to recover and simple ways to find this inconsistency. But we've materialized views. Between the base table you built the materialized view on that and materialized view, there is no ways to recover consistency over when drop materialized view and create it again. Maybe I'm wrong, at least that was the state some time ago. Maybe Artyom would fix me. What do you think of materialized views? So, uh, like you said, they're experimental and there are limitations. And I actually displayed those limitations for you here. Again, you can find all of this information available on datastacks.com slash dev. There is a Cassandra Fundamentals course there. Uh, and the problem with, with uh, materialized views, well, let me say actually advantages first. So it, you can always create a separate table instead of uh, materialized view, but then you will have to manage it on, in your application on your own. So you have to insert, you duplicate data, you denormalize, uh, and you have to insert the same data into two tables, like we did with, uh, with uh, trades tables in investment example. We have many trade tables. Could, could, have we, could, could we use uh, materialized view there, there or not? The answer in that specific case for trades, we cannot because the materialized view has one limitation that you can only change one, um, one uh, column in, in, the, in the primary key. So it didn't work for our use case. We could not use materialized view there. They do not apply. But in case if they apply, for example, I have um, users by ID table, and then I have table users by name, like in this example. Um, so what's the danger? What's the limitation? The danger is that uh, rarely, but it can happen, uh, that uh, the materialized view becomes out of sync with the table. And Cassandra doesn't give you any tool to check this or to fix that. So you have to fix it manually or in your application. So is it a problem or is it not a problem? Um, well, you either choose to maintain your own separate table and you do it in your application or you ha have to sometimes periodically make sure that your materialized view uh, and your uh, base table essentially are uh, synchronized. They have consistently the same data. And, and that's, that can be done. That can be done with, with Spark, for example. If it's available to you, then it's easy to do just uh, retrieve data from one table, retrieve data from materialized views, compare. Uh, we used to actually have even examples of how to do that uh, in our analytics. Um, course maybe it's still there but uh, also you can you have some suggestions here uh, if you using if you're not using local one or one and you use local quorum or, or higher then most likely you will not even have that situation where they become out of sync and so I'm kind of um, leaning toward uh, so if you all uh, so I would not be afraid to use materialized views. That's my personal opinion. And, and DataStax Enterprise actually uses materialized views in um, DataStax Graph. So I would not be afraid because I know the limitations. I know what they can do for me. Um, on the other hand, uh, if I'm already, if have a bunch of tables that I have to maintain and, and they are not applicable, that, that I cannot use materialized views instead, then maybe it's not worse for me to create some materialized views and some tables. I will just choose tables and, and, and have the same procedure for, for all of my data duplication. Okay, I'm done, thank you. Yep, that's an incredible answer. Actually, that's amazing, that's amazing. 
You know what? It's always a big pleasure to do the workshops like this one with you, and we definitely have to do it more often. Uh, for the topic, uh, for the topics, our attendees may ask us to run, or maybe you have some of your own ideas to do in the future. That would be incredible. So uh, we are seven minutes out of time already, and we still have to a thing to do, but very, very, very important thing. So I'm switching back to my screen. So very important place to know is slash dev datastacks.com slash dev learn how to succeed with Apache Cassandra there are uh, many great people of the data stacks and not only data stacks working of the examples and educational materials how do you use Cassandra Cassandra is great and powerful but that's not the easiest database to use okay so uh, you have to learn some things to be successful that's fine because well we are getting well paid for that big data brings some problems but big data brings money. When a uh, homework assignment we suggest you to do today or tomorrow, preferably today, use it the link provided um, on this datastacks.com dash learn dash data modeling by example. We have many examples and what we want you to cover is a messaging data example. Uh, time series data modeling, it's uh, very close to sensor data modeling, but expanded like a little bit wider. Shopping car data modeling also can be very interesting, but in general, pick the topic you like the most, because well, that's what matters. But uh, we recommend those three, 020506. And uh, the one we skipped today to be more on time is investment portfolio. You can walk through it on your own. Then, next point, we run workshops, Cassandra-related workshops weekly and some more events. So, at datastacks.com slash workshops, you can find more, our, more of our events, uh, not only this one, but we have more and more coming. By the way, if you like them, you have uh, this gentleman uh, to the left of me, Artyom, and directly under him, you have subscribe button and like button. Now, that's your job to push them, okay? Then, uh, giveaways. As a thank you for joining us live, we would like to offer you a choice of giveaways. Everyone, not only top three, but first, option one, you can choose a free or not free, but data stack sponsored certification. Normally, one certification exam costs almost $150. As you attended this uh, workshop, you can get a voucher valid for three months with two attempts included. If you are passing the first exam for the developer, for example, certification from the first attempt, you can still use this voucher to use your second attempt for the administrator certification. So you can become Apache Cassandra certified developer and certified administrator using the one single voucher and that's like a very, very solid thing to do. So we do recommend you. Notice, if you are new with Cassandra, this workshop may be and will be not enough because it's not so easy. So we have uh, some uh, specific preparation for certification workshop. But in general, the most recommended way is to get uh, proper courses at the academy.datastacks.com. And one more certification coming soon is Apache Cassandra operations with Kubernetes, but it's not yet released. I hope you release it soon. Artyom, maybe you know any dates? When are we going to release this one? I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. cannot comment on that, sorry. We are working and we don't want to set a fixed date because we prefer quality. Particular date will not give you too much, but a good. A balanced exam will give you a lot. Um, second option, if you have used voucher already, if you are certified and if you don't need certification anymore, you can get $300 Astra code. Astra is a Cassandra as a service. It's a managed by Datastacks. Cassandra, the all the headache about the running Cassandra, keeping Cassandra flying is on us. And you just use that without any need to handle servers or Cassandra nodes, running node tool commands, and so on. It's on us. So, 
you can get $300 Astra code and use it uh, with uh, Datastax Astra, Cassandra as a service. Thank you. We are done for today. And um, it was a great day. Thank you for so many great questions. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we have more workshops coming in. And I think we are done for today. Yep. yep. Thank you so much. Um, I, I do see a few more questions about time series yep. and um, uh, real-time trades. Cassandra is a great, great database for time series, used a lot for time series. Um, uh, and uh, we have the time series, uh, specifically data modeling use case, so check, the, check it out. Sergio, I believe you had a lot of questions. Um, the, when comparing Cassandra to a database that, that was specifically designed for time series, uh, the only disadvantage is that, the, the only advantage that the other database may have is specific operators that can be used with time series, like compute automatically ag aggregates and things like that. But we're kind of doing that in the example we have, different precision of data. And um, the with, with respect to using Kafka there, uh, please do check how we use Kafka with Cassandra. We also have Pulsar, uh, which was announced, announced recently. We have the connector for, for the Pulsar and uh, uh, the Pulsar has many advantages over Kafka. Uh, so, uh, hope this this helps and uh, very happy to be part of this workshop and help to do it again soon. Yep. I'm sending our LinkedIn links uh, to YouTube chat. So, uh, feel free to uh, add us. Uh, we spent two and a half hours together working on the complex projects, uh, working on a complex thing. So we are now almost uh, colleagues and you can uh, definitely add us on LinkedIn. Well then, um, I see a question here. Uh, it's just jumped out. Uh, many attendees have uh, very little of no knowledge of Cassandra. Uh, for a workshop label at Advanced, it would be nice to refer those attendees to our workshops. Uh, so. Uh, yes, this, that's an advanced level workshop indeed. If you feel uncomfortable with this level, that's uh, pretty understandable. We have a lot of introduction to Cassandra workshops recorded and available at this uh, channel. So maybe I would ask one of our colleagues to throw in a link to our um, workshops on GitHub. Or better, take our full eight-part eight part course and uh, skip the questions what you are able to cover the actual workshop topic more in depth that's a good suggestion so thank you for the feedback we will find a way to uh, to do the great information nice one workshop every week keep up the good work you guys are rocking yes we do <laughs> yes we are rocking thank you artem thank you everyone we are done for today it was incredible time together with you Thank you and see you later then. And now in the, the, in the end, our favorite music for you to celebrate the ending of a workshop and you getting the vouchers and getting more knowledge how to handle that. So I have a moment, good moment to say goodbye. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye.